The title of the sermon this morning is Five Steps to Effective Evangelism. Five Steps to Effective Evangelism. Christ's mission when he came to earth was to seek and to save the lost. It says that in Luke 19.10. That's what Jesus said. He said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus did a lot of things. He came to do a lot of things. He did miracles, and he came to give us an example, and he came to teach. But the primary mission of Jesus in coming to earth was to save the lost, seek and save the lost, was to die on the cross for us, for our sins. We were the lost that he came to seek and to save. And Jesus has called all of us now to share in that mission of seeking and saving the lost. You know, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and he's still on that mission, but he's not on earth anymore, not physically. So how does he accomplish the mission of seeking and saving the lost? He does it through his people, through you and me. In the Bible, we see Christians leading others to Christ all the time. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he pointed his own disciples to Jesus. He said, look, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was saying, He must increase, I must decrease. In other words, guys, it's not about me anymore. It's about Jesus. He's the one I've been telling you about. And so two of John's disciples immediately began to follow Jesus. John pointed his disciples to Jesus. Those two uh, disciples were Andrew and, according to tradition, uh, the apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John. Well, immediately, when Andrew becomes a follower of Jesus, what does he do? He goes and he finds his brother Peter. He says, Peter, you got to come and meet Jesus. And so Andrew and John and Peter, all of these new followers of Jesus, they go on to become soul winners themselves, fishers of men themselves, and they lead countless people to Christ because of their evangelism. Another example of evangelism is Philip. When Philip became a follower of Jesus, Philip immediately went and found his friend Nathaniel and brought Nathanael to Jesus. Philip said, you'll never believe who I found, the Messiah. And so Nathanael came to follow Jesus, and Philip and Nathanael went on to become great soul winners as well. After the martyrdom of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, the first Christian martyr, first time a Christian was killed for his faith, a great wave of persecution broke out against the Christians in Jerusalem. And so all the Christians who were living there, which is the bulk of them, the majority of the Christians who were living there, They scattered. They left Jerusalem to flee persecution. And so they scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, but they didn't stop living for Jesus. It says in in Acts 8.4, the verses on the screen, Acts 8.4, it says, So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Now, mind you, the apostles were the ones who actually stayed in Jerusalem. So it was all of the lay people like you people who weren't full-time staff members for the church, who weren't professional Christians, if you will. It was all the lay people who scattered, and as they went, they went preaching the word. They went sharing the gospel. And so God used the persecution of Stephen and the persecution against the church to actually cause the gospel to go out quicker and in a greater way. So all these Christians are doing evangelism, and this pattern has continued for 2,000 years. The way that Jesus accomplishes his mission is that first you are the mission, and then you get saved and you go on mission. First you become a Christian, and then you go try to help others become Christians. You try to lead others to faith in Christ. And then they go and lead others to Christ. And that's how it happens. And that's called evangelism. Evangelism is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. It's helping lost people come to, come to know Christ. And it's one of the central purposes of your life as a Christian. And so from time to time, it's good just to do a message on evangelism. What is our calling as Christians and how can we get better at it? How can you be a more effective witness for Christ? I want to give you five steps this morning. Five steps to effective evangelism. Number one, to be an effective witness for Jesus, you've got to know your calling. You have to know your calling. You need to know down to the core of your being, you need to know in your conscience, feel it in your conscience, that God has called you to the task of evangelism. You need to be convicted 
that that's not just the job of the preacher or the, the church staff members or the missionaries, but that every Christian is called to evangelism. If you want to be an effective witness, you have to know that God has placed that call on your life, not just mine. Every Christian is to be a witness for Jesus Christ. What's evangelism? Here's a definition for you. My favorite is by Bill Bright. He said, evangelism is taking the message of the good news of Jesus Christ to people and explaining it to them in a way that they can get in on it if they want to. Evangelism is taking the message of the good news of Jesus Christ to people and explaining it to them in a way that they can get in on it if they want to. So, it's not an imposition, it's the great proposition. We are sharing the gospel with people in a winsome, contagious way in the hopes that they will follow Jesus. Evangelism is simply leading lost people to Jesus. D.T. Niles said, evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And that's what it is. As a Christian, you're not better than other people. In fact, you realize the depth of your depravity more than other people. You realize that you're a sinner in need of a savior. You're, you, you are poor in spirit. And so you've been saved. You found eternal life. You found salvation. You found hope and purpose and power over sin. And so you found spiritual bread. And all you're doing now is you're sharing with others how they can find bread too. Here's where the bread is. It's Jesus Christ. The old preacher Adrian Rogers said, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. I'm just a nobody. It's humility. I'm just a nobody. I'm not anybody special. Trying to tell everybody, as many people as we can find, as many people as we can get the word to. I'm trying to tell everybody about somebody, that's Jesus, who can save anybody. No matter how lost they are. No matter how sinful they are. Jesus can save anybody. Every Christian is called to reach the lost. Acts 1.8, this is what Jesus said right before he ascended into heaven. His death and then his burial and then his resurrection. And then right before he ascended back into heaven, he told his followers, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. When does that happen? The moment you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. And he gives you power to be a witness. He says, that, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus told his followers. You will be my witnesses. It's our job to go out there and witness about Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon, the, the preacher from the 19th century, said every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. In other words, as a Christian, what makes a Christian is not just what you believe, but the fact that you're trying to get others to believe. There's something that happens to you when you become a Christian that you want that. You want everybody you know to become a Christian. There's only two things that you can do on earth that you can't do in heaven. Only two things that you can, you can do on earth that you can't do in heaven. Number one, you can, you can sin and you can be a witness. And why do you think God left you on earth whenever he saved you and didn't just zap you to heaven, transport you to heaven immediately? To sin or to witness? To be a witness. To be an evangelist for Jesus Christ. Evangelistic fervor is a mark of genuine salvation. Somebody said, those on the road to heaven will not be content to go there alone. Those on the road to heaven will not be content to go there alone. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, said, Our promoting God's glory and the conversion of others is a signal evidence of our salvation. So if you're truly saved, is what he's saying, if you're truly saved, if you've truly been converted, then you're going to be zealous, fervent, eager, desirous to win others to Jesus Christ. The reformer Martin Luther said, if he has faith, the believer cannot be restrained. He betrays himself. He breaks out. He confesses and teaches this gospel to the people at the risk of life itself. If you're truly saved, there's this compulsion. This, the, the Holy Spirit is, if you will, putting such a, 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 a calling on your life, 
a conviction, um, an urgency that you can't help it. You want others to know about Jesus. You want to get, be involved in letting others know about Jesus. How can you claim to truly believe in the eternality of heaven and hell and to claim that you truly love Jesus and to claim that you truly love your neighbor as yourself and not be zealous for evangelism? It's impossible. And so every Christian is called to evangelism. That's number one. Number two, the second step to effective evangelism is to know the stakes. Know what's at stake. You need to know your calling, that you are called to evangelism, but you also need to know why this is so important. You need to know that without Christ, people spend eternity in hell. But with Christ, people go to heaven for eternity. That eternity is at stake. John 3.16, the, the most famous verse in the Bible. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. There's only two destinations, possible destinations whenever you die. You get either eternal life or you perish. That's what's at stake. Carl F.H. Henry, the Christian scholar, said the good news is only good if it gets there in time. People need to know Christ, and they need to know him now before they pass away. Let me explain the importance of evangelism in four simple points. Number one, it's the most urgent task of the church. Evangelism is the most urgent task of the church because people don't live forever on earth. They're going to die. Your family and your friends and our neighbors, they're going to die. And if they die before they receive Christ, then they're going to go to hell. So the most urgent thing that we can do as a church is evangelism. We can do a lot of good things, but the most urgent is evangelism. Also, evangelism makes the greatest impact on the world. Think about all the different things that our church could be involved in to try to help our community. All the different causes that are out there, all the different needs, all the different kinds of hurts that are out there, all the different ways that we could be helping. And there's a lot of good things that we can do, a lot of good things we should do. But nothing makes a bigger impact on our community and in the world at large than evangelism, than actually leading people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. One person said, give a man a dollar and you cheer his heart. Give him a dream and you challenge his heart. Give him Christ and you change his heart. And so more than fighting poverty or disease, more than fighting in politics, evangelism it makes the biggest impact on the world. A third reason why evangelism is so important is because it's the most compassionate thing we can do. When you think of compassion ministries, what's the first thing that comes to your mind usually? Helping the needy, helping the poor. And that's good. That is compassion. But the most compassionate thing that you can possibly do for someone is to share the gospel with them. Is to, to give them the option, the, the, the ability to believe in Jesus and receive eternal life. Francis Chan said, True compassion takes into account far more than what a person feels today. It takes into account what he or she will feel on Judgment Day. Evangelism is the most compassionate thing we can do. And evangelism, number four, is the one thing that God celebrates. The Bible says that when one sinner repents and turns to Christ, that all of heaven throws a big party. Because in heaven, they know the stakes. In heaven, they understand the importance of evangelism. And they realize people are dying every day and going to hell. And so in heaven, they are just, just on the edge of their seats, just hoping and praying and waiting and watching for people to come to Christ. That's the most exciting thing that can possibly happen. In the book, Not a Fan, by Kyle Eidelman, a really good book, Not a Fan, he tells the story about a group of missionaries in what is now Suriname in South America. I don't know if that's how you say it. But these missionaries wanted to reach the inhabitants of a nearby island. They wanted to reach them with the gospel of Christ. The only problem was that most of these islanders were slaves. And the slave masters would only allow slaves to talk to slaves. They wouldn't allow outsiders to come in and talk to them. And so these missionaries 
sold themselves into slavery so that they could then reach those islanders with the gospel, and many of them came to Christ. Now, why in the world would they make such a huge sacrifice, sell themselves into slavery? I, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure it was just probably indentured servanthood, which was very, very common. So four to seven years of slavery, but still, why in the world would they make such a huge sacrifice? It's because they knew the stakes. They knew that there's nothing more important that we can be involved in in life than reaching people for Jesus. And so know your calling, know the stakes. Number three, to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ, you've got to know the gospel. You've got to know the gospel. I want everybody in our church to make sure that you are very clear on the gospel. For someone to get saved, they have to believe the gospel. So if you want to lead others to Jesus, you've got to be able to share the gospel with them, the gospel message. The word gospel means good news of Jesus Christ. You've got to be able to share that with somebody for them to believe it, for them to get saved. So it's essential to be an effective witness that you know the content of our message. You've got to know the gospel. Romans 1.16 says it like this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Never be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. How do people get saved? By believing the gospel. And we should never be ashamed of the gospel because that's how people come to be saved, come to have eternal life, come to, to have their entire lives changed for the better because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you need to know the gospel. And so there's four words that you need to know if you want to effectively share the gospel with people. And this is how you can remember the gospel. And I recommend if you have your Bible that you write these four words in your Bible. This is the gospel in four words. And write these in, in the, like the, the front cover or the back cover of your Bible. That way you can always remember these and know where to, to look for them if you need them. But if you're writing an email to your friend to share the gospel, or if you're writing a letter to a friend, or if you're writing... Uh, a note to your friend, or if you're just talking to your friend and religion comes up and you actually have a chance to explain what is the core message of Christianity, the gospel, what is it? With these four words, you can share the gospel in just a few sentences. And that's what you have to be able to do. If sharing the gospel for you takes an entire sermon, <laughs> nobody's going to sit there and listen to an entire sermon unless they're coming to church. And then they still struggle to listen. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to know how to share the gospel quickly, briefly, and you use these four words. The first one is creation. They all start with C. Creation, God created you for a relationship with him. God created you for a relationship with him. A relationship that would last for eternity. And it's through that relationship that we find eternal life, we find happiness and peace and joy and purpose and significance and meaning and understanding and wisdom and strength. It's, we are created for this relationship with God. That's the first, creation. Number two is corruption. Corruption. All of us have sinned against God going all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve. And when you sin against God, because God is holy and he can't buy, cannot be in the presence of sin, our relationship with God was severed. It was broken. There's now this cosmic chasm between man and God. Our relationship with God, the very thing we were created for, the thing that gives us life and joy and peace and meaning, this thing was, was made impossible. It was broken because of our sin. And when you die as a sinner, the punishment is eternal Separation from God in hell. So that's corruption. The third C word is crucifixion. Crucifixion. Even though we're sinners, God still loved us the same. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place for our sins. So that we could be reconciled to God. Crucifixion. The cross. God sent Jesus to take away our penalty, our punishment, so that we don't have to be punished. And so that we can be reconciled to God. And then the last C word is conversion. Conversion. Conversion is the, is the, the step that people need to make to receive Christ, to appropriate the gospel into their own lives. Conversion. And 
to become a Christian. What somebody needs to do is simply believe. Believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Believing in Christ involves turning from your sins to Jesus Christ as Lord, and it involves relying upon Jesus Christ alone for salvation, not relying upon religion, not relying upon good works, turning from your sins and relying upon Jesus Christ. That's conversion. And so if you know those four words and if you understand them, and by the way, the more you explain them and practice on each other, practice on your spouse, practice on your parents, practice on your siblings, practice with your, your kids, Sharing those, the gospel through those four words, the, the better you get at it and the easier you can explain it to others. So to be an effective witness, you've got to know the gospel. Know the gospel. And by the way, remember that that is where the power of God is. It's when people hear the gospel that the Holy Spirit moves in their lives, opens their hearts, and draws them to Christ. And so those words are powerful. The message is powerful. The power is in the message. And so use the gospel. Share it. Who knows? Listen, so many people have gotten saved. Well, everybody who's gotten saved has gotten saved by hearing the gospel. But so many people have gotten saved by just reading a simple gospel tract. By just reading the gospel. And they got you know, it wasn't somebody sharing. It wasn't Billy Graham preaching to them. They just read the gospel, and God is able to move through the gospel message to change hearts. So share that gospel message with people. And then number four, to be an effective witness, you need to know your target. You need to know your target, your target audience. That's a marketing term, your target audience. This is the people that you're trying to reach. Now, as Christians, we want to reach everybody. We want to reach the whole world, but you specifically have a target audience, and that target audience is the people that are closest to you. It's the people that are naturally in your circle of influence. This is your, your siblings, your spouse, your closest friends, classmates, teammates, coworkers. This is your target audience. If you remember the story of Andrew, who did Andrew first lead to Jesus? It was his brother. That's the natural thing to do. You lead the people closest to you to Jesus. And so your target audience is your grandkids. It's your children. If you're a parent, it's your children. That's your primary audience. That's who you're trying to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or your siblings. You may feel like maybe one of, my, maybe one of your siblings is not saved. That's your target audience. Um, and on and on, the people closest to you. And so start praying regularly for the people in your target audience. By name, Lord, please save my friend so-and-so. Please save my brother so-and-so. Start praying for their salvation regularly. And you need to look for opportunities to share the gospel with your target audience. Now, let me explain opportunities to you, because this is a really good, um, helpful evangelistic principle. Researchers have actually talked to people about what led them to come to Christ, where, where they were in life whenever they became a Christian. And what they found is people are usually, um, it's usually three things that cause someone to turn to Christ. So look for these three things. These are your opportunities, your best opportunities usually to share the gospel with a friend. First of all, number one, something was broken. When something is broken in your friend's life, whether it's their marriage, whether they're going through a very difficult time with, with, uh, at work, layoff, uh, sickness, uh, the death of a loved one, but something was broken that's when people are very open to the gospel, when, they're, when, they, when they are personally broken. So look for that. When, you're, when your friends go through a very difficult time, the second thing is something was missing. Whenever your friend is feeling uh, empty on the inside, they're feeling like they lack purpose, they lack direction, they lack meaning, they lack significance, they're lacking joy and peace, they just know something's missing in their life, they're down. Well, we know 
that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit gives you all the joy you need. So something is missing. Whenever they're down and depressed, down in the dumps, they realize something's missing in their life. That's God that's missing. And then, number three, something has changed. When people go through major life transitions, maybe the birth of a child, maybe they move to a new city, um, maybe it could be a, a divorce, or maybe they're newly married, but a major change, starting a new school, anything like that, starting college, major changes like that, usually people are more open to the gospel. So look for those three things. Those are your best opportunities. Something is broken, something is missing, something has changed. And your friends will be most ripe to hear the gospel. Know your target. And then number five, to be an effective witness for Christ, you need to know the plan. You need to know the plan. Evangelism is not meant to be a solo act. It's meant to be a team sport. In fact, that's why, one of the reasons why God places us in a church. God wants us to work together to reach our community and our friends and family members for Christ. And so you can call this partnership evangelism or team evangelism. And the way it works is come and see and go and tell. Go and tell is, is your part as an, as an individual. You go out and you tell your friends about Jesus and, and you invite them to church. That's go and tell. The second part is the church's job. The rest of us are going to work together for come and see so that whenever your friends come to church, our church is ready for them. Our church is ready to explain the gospel to them. Our church is ready to reach them for Christ. So go and tell and come and see. It's a team effort. And so as a church, we need to learn how to get ready for company. We need to learn how to be ready. I, we, need, we as a church need to be ready for whenever you finally are able to get your friend to come. You've been praying for them. You've been working on them. What can, you know, you finally get them to visit. Our church needs to be ready every Sunday. And every person in here has a role to play in getting ready for company. And so that's, that's what I want to talk to you about now. The first part is you need to be a witness. You need to be passionate about evangelism, zealous about evangelism. You need to be praying for your friends, sharing the gospel, inviting them to church. And then this last point, the plan, is we as a church need to make sure we're ready for whenever we bring our friends to church. So how do we do that? Greg Laurie said, a church that doesn't evangelize will fossilize. A church that doesn't evangelize will fossilize. Our church, we've got to make sure that we're not just a social club, that it's not just us four and no more. We are a rescue ship, not a cruise ship. We are on a rescue mission together. This is a missionary society, if you will, missionary club. We're here for a purpose. And so we've got to make sure that we don't turn inward, but that we keep looking outward and that we keep uh, making ourselves prepared and ready for outsiders to come in. So let me give you, and this is the last thing that we're going to talk about this morning, 10 quick principles for how we can get ready for company as a church. 10 quick principles. Again, all of you uh, have a part to play in these. The first one is the compassion principle. The compassion principle means don't expect unbelievers to act like believers. So when you, whenever an unbeliever comes to our church, don't be surprised if they act like an unbeliever. They're an unbeliever. And so we need to, if you will, give them permission. And so that means when an unbeliever comes to our church and they say something that's inappropriate, off color, or they're wearing a t-shirt that, that, with a message on it that's unbiblical, ungodly, or they're wearing a hat that says something ungodly, um, or they've got a lot of tattoos. We need to make sure that we don't give them bad looks or that we don't fuss at them. And I've heard, I'm sure you've heard stories, I've heard countless stories of people going to church and people judged them. People were mean to them. People were rude to them. You can't wear that. You can't say that in church. As Christians, yeah, there's a standard we have to live up to, but unbelievers... They don't live by the same standard as us. 
And we're trying to win them for Christ. So we've got to make sure to be accepting and loving to unbelievers when they come to our, into our midst. We want to lead them to Christ and then disciple them. And so allow unbelievers to act like unbelievers. Number two, the second principle is the parking principle. The parking principle. This just means leave the best parking spots for newcomers. Now, these are not things you have to do, but these are just some, some things that I encourage you to do if we want to get ready for company. And so I'm not saying you need to park all the way at Starbucks. Um, and, and if you're handicapped, then, then please, by all means, park in the, the handicapped spots or if you, if you um, are physically uh, unable to walk long distances, that's fine. But what I'm talking about is simply leave the first couple of spaces. If you're a member of regular tender, just leave the first couple of spaces open for newcomers so that when they come to church, it just makes, the, makes for a better experience when they can park up close. So that's the parking principle. The third one is the seating principle. The seating principle. If we want to get ready for company, we have to um, understand where newcomers like to sit. And, and newcomers like to sit in the back toward the door. That's just where they like to sit. It's the most comfortable place. It's the safest place. Uh, quick and easy exit, just in case things get crazy. And so one of the ways that you can help us get ready for company is sit closer to the front, more toward the center. You say, well, I don't like sitting there. Well, neither do newcomers. And so uh, what we're trying to do is work together to make sure that whenever our friends bring their lost friends to to, to church, that, they're, that we're ready for them. So let's work together to do that. That's the seating principle. Number four is the five-minute principle. The five-minute principle. The first five minutes after church, instead of getting to work real quick or instead of bolting out the door to go to lunch and watch the Saints game or something, just spend five minutes just visiting. Visiting with each other, and especially if there's newcomers around you, visiting with them. Introduce yourself to them. Say hi to them, but just spend five minutes before we get to work, before we get busy. Five-minute principle. This makes us a friendlier, more welcome church. The next one is the 10-foot principle. The 10-foot principle simply means that any time at church that somebody walks by you within 10 feet, stop, smile, and say hello. Actually, you don't need to stop. Just smile and say hello. I've heard so many stories of people going to church, not our church, but going to church, and nobody acknowledged them. Nobody said hello. Nobody even looked at them. There are a lot of churches, and this is something you've got to watch out for, for the churches where they can come, they can sit down through the whole service and leave without anybody saying hello to them. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. That's one way to really run people off. So the 10-foot principle, and this, by the way, we practice on each other. You're not just doing this with newcomers or with people you, you don't know. Anytime somebody's within 10 feet, you just smile, say hello. Or however you say hello. What's up? I don't know. And then number six is the magnetic principle. The magnetic, med, magnetic principle. Shut it. You need to act like a magnet on Sunday mornings to newcomers and to people who are alone. Act like a magnet. When you see a newcomer at church, when you see somebody that you don't know, you don't recognize, make, like, uh, make a beeline to that person and just introduce yourself. Say, well, I'm glad you're here. This is who I am and, and where are you from and what's your name? So glad you're here. But this is for people who are new, but also people that maybe you've seen a few times, but maybe they might be alone they're not with people. They're not sitting by people. They're just kind of isolated from others. Um, work hard to make these people feel welcome, to pull them in, the magnetic principle. Now, some of you in our church, in every church, are more extroverted than others. And listen, this is where your personality can really be a blessing to the church, and you've got to use your gifts. There's some people in our church that are very introverted, and awkward, and we don't want them talking to, to newcomers, all right? 
But there are others of you who are super bubbly and outgoing, and I'm thinking of Mickey, and I'm thinking of Carter, and, and others of you, and my mom and dad, both of you. Um, so you really use your spiritual gifts here and go out, and, and when you see new people, make sure that you say hello and welcome them and, and um, make them feel comfortable and welcome. Number seven is the attendance principle. The attendance principle is simply make your attendance at church a priority. And I know I'm talking to people who it is a priority, but I want to encourage you to keep doing that because just your attendance actually makes a difference in reaching new people. Because when new people come to church, and I tell you what, June and in July are the two worst months of the year. This is when everybody's on vacation. But when new people come to church and they see an empty room, they're thinking, well, this place is dead. Nobody comes to this church. And this really makes a difference in a small church like ours. Um, but if they come and they see a, a, a full room, see a bunch of people who are fellowshipping and, and having a good time together, who are into the message, they say, wow, this place is alive. This is exciting. This, this is exciting. This is something I might want to be a part of. And so just by being here, it makes a difference. Your attendance. And then number eight is the practical principle. The practical principle. This one is specifically for me, but I wanted you to know it, that as a preacher, my sermons need to be practical, helpful, and understandable. People need to leave saying, wow, the Bible is actually helpful. That really helped me. That that." That applies to my life. I can really use that. I understood that. The Bible's understandable. So the messages need to be practical, not just over everybody's head to where nobody can understand anything, not to just show off how smart I am. Um, And so that's something I strive for. The message needs to be practical and helpful. And then number nine, this applies to, to all of us, but especially those who serve in some capacity on Sunday morning, is the excellence principle. The excellence principle. We need to strive for excellence in everything we do on Sunday mornings. And this starts, especially whenever we have a new building of our own, but this starts in the parking lot and the landscaping and the decor of the building on the inside and the cleanliness of the building and the smell and uh, the way that we dress, especially those of us who are in positions of leadership and and on stage. The music needs to be top-notch and Uh, hospitality needs to be done with excellence. And all these different things, we need to strive for excellence. You know what happens whenever things aren't done with excellence? It becomes a distraction. Anything in a a, a church or even in a business, if you go to a restaurant and something is out of place, you see a a mouse run across the, the floor, that's a distraction. It's distracting from the product that the business is trying to sell. Well, when people see poor quality at church, what it does is it distracts them from Jesus. I've heard of preachers wearing crazy shoes before. And I don't even know what kind of shoes these were, but I've heard of people so focused on the preacher's shoes, they were so distracting that they totally missed the message. His shoes were just distracting. And so uh, excellence is an important important thing. We need to show people that this matters to us. Jesus matters to us enough to give it our all, okay? So strive for excellence. And then number 10, the last one is the worship principle. The worship principle. Passionate worship is attractive. It's magnetic, Because when people come in, newcomers and lost people, when they come in and they see a congregation who are passionately singing to God, I'm not saying you have to raise your hands, but people who are passionately singing to God, it communicates to them that, wow, these people really believe this stuff. These people really do love this Jesus fella. They're singing like Jesus has really made a difference in their lives. They are really thankful to Jesus. They're really happy about something. And so it makes our faith look more believable whenever we are really worshiping with passion. 
And so it's easy to come on Sunday mornings and to sit back and kind of be entertained or just kind of watch the show. That's not what we're here to do, is it? We're here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to worship him with passion. And so I want to challenge you each and every Sunday when you come in, block out distractions, forget about the people to the right and the left of you, not in a selfish way, but forget about what they think of you or what they're doing and just focus on truly worshiping the Lord. And that really does make a difference in the eyes of newcomers. Worship with passion. Recently, I was rereading the Harriet Tubman story. Harriet Tubman was a slave who escaped from Maryland, a Maryland plantation. Whenever she heard that she was going to be sold to a plantation uh, even further south where they pretty much work you to death. And so she ran away. She escaped from the Maryland plantation, eventually made her way to Pennsylvania where she was free. But then what's remarkable is that she saved her money, and in 1850, she snuck back into Maryland to rescue her sister and her sister's two children. A few months later, she returned to get her brothers and two sisters. Altogether, Harriet Tubman made 19 trips south and rescued more than 300 slaves. She had a code name, Moses, because of how many of her people she delivered from bondage. Now, why in the world did Harriet Tubman risk her life all of those times? Did she risk her freedom all of those times? Did she spend all of this hard-earned money on these trips south? Why did she do that? It's because she knew freedom was too precious to keep to herself. She had been freed, and it was too precious to keep that to herself. You know, as Christians, we have been freed by Jesus Christ. In fact, that's the topic of next Sunday's sermon. I'm going to talk about Harriet Tubman again. That's the topic of next Sunday's sermon. We are free in Christ. We've been freed from sin and from Satan and from bondage and from hopelessness and from hell. And we have eternal life and abundant life. And if Harriet Tubman is willing to risk it all and go to such great lengths and great costs and great sacrifices for temporal freedom. As Christians, what should we be willing to do to reach lost souls for Jesus Christ? And so our church needs to be passionate about evangelism, about reaching people for Jesus. And so I want to encourage you to keep praying for your lost friends. Keep praying that our church can win the lost for Jesus, can be effective at reaching souls for Christ And then do your part in this team evangelism effort. The message of Jesus Christ is the most important message in the world. It's it's more important than the cure for cancer. And you have it. You've got that message. Don't hide it. Get the message out. Let's bow our heads and, and we'll pray together and close. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, that you have saved us. Needy beggars. Sinners in need of grace. You saved us, and now you've called us into your army to serve you, to be your ambassadors, to be your heralds. We pray, Lord, that we would feel called to the mission of evangelism, that you would convict us, and that you would equip us with power and with the knowledge of the gospel, that you would give us boldness wherever we go and love for lost people, to see them the way that you see them. Give us opportunities and help us to be ready for them. And Lord, we just pray that you would use us to reach lost people for Jesus Christ. Help our church to continue to grow in that and to to get more and more ready for company as a church family. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.